Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to be reacting to Zizarin's recent interview with GGG Harishi and GGG Jonathan. This is a really exciting one because it shows that GGG as a company is changing a lot. And that's why they've kept ahead, even in an industry like ARPGs, that often feels like it's stuck in the past. Personally, I've always been a big fan of Path of Exile, and I think it truly is the best ARPG on the market. But if you don't change and adapt, you'll eventually fall behind the curve. And it's very clear that Jonathan in particular is going to be very aggressive about making those changes, so we can expect a completely different Path of Exile from what we know for both PoE2 and possibly even PoE1, as it seems like a lot of the changes are going to splash over. With that said, I'm only going to be looking at a few select clips on topics that interest me and that hopefully interest you guys as well. So do be sure to watch Zizarin's full interview, which I'll link to down below to get the entire context and see if you have other questions, some of which you might find really cool. Also, as more interviews come out, I'm going to be keeping up with them, so do be sure to get subscribed, leave a like while you're down there, and for now, let's jump into things, starting with the first topic that I found interesting, which is talking about loot in Path of Exile 2, and also, of course, loot in Path of Exile 1. So, I guess my follow-up there, and, and like how I would solve that, is actually a further question I have, but I feel mm -hmm. like loot right now is very like homogenized in Path of Exile. I think it started somewhere around Legion, where we started getting a lot of other League mechanics as rewards as mm -hmm. part of Legion, right? Like you would start getting um, uh, catalysts and, and other things like that. So mm -hmm. I, I personally think that if and any mechanic that was like that was the only place to get it, then you already have a, a reason to keep farming it there. And um, I guess my follow up there is, is that something we're going to see in PoE 2? Like things being very specific, the only place to get things. That's something I really enjoyed with Heist, that like Grand Heist was the only place to get replicas. Yeah. That's something that I'm really glad Ziz asked, because I also enjoy, not necessarily Heist, not a big fan of heist, but I like that if I want to get a bunch of fossils and resonators, I know that I go to delve. If I want a bunch of essences, well, now I can go to essence memories, but before I'd run essence in my maps or run expedition logbooks with Tujin or do simulacrums. And that's where things got really muddy. I think the main mechanic should be the best source and it should be efficient to the point where even though the entire player base gets a little bit of everything in aggregate from mechanics like Legion, you know where to go to get the good stuff. Uh, we definitely feel like having rewards tied to a mechanic and only that mechanic is definitely a good thing. And good. we will definitely try to be doing that going forward, I think, in PoE 2 for the most part. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think even in PoE 1, we're kind of trying to walk back a bit some of the like way other ways yeah. to get content. Um, mm -hmm. I've noticed like, that. We've been kind of moving more there in that direction. There was definitely a period there where there was like way too much re like use mm -hmm. of other league's uh, rewards, I would say. And yeah, I completely yeah. agree that like for like in order to make it so that like it, it's really good for diversity of endgame to have it so that each um, uh, uh -oh. um, got rewards oh, separately. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with that. That's something I was really yeah. hoping to see uh, with like yeah, less yeah. homogenization of loot. The last point that Jonathan touched on there of it's important to the end game to have the loot available and be the best from one source is really, really important because one of the things that makes PoE's economy work when it's at its best is, okay, I don't really like blight, so I'm not going to farm blight at all, but I do like essence. I have essences, you have oils. I will sell you, or more likely a third party, a bunch of my essences. Now I have currency, and I'm going to use some of that currency to buy your oils and anoint my amulet. There's not everyone self-sufficient, so there's a reason to trade, which keeps the economy moving, which means it's a lot harder for one single thing to be the only thing of value. But let's just pretend for a second that one mechanic like Legion gave everything, not just currency, but everything. Well, all of a sudden, there's no reason for anyone to farm anything but Legion, because it's the best for everything. So the less homogenized loot is, I would say the better. Admittedly, I'm sure there's a point where it's too far, but that point's probably quite far away from where we are now. 
more specific content um, in mm -hmm. certain cases. The thing we've just got to be careful of is we have to make sure that our systems don't encourage uh, let's farm something for a while, yeah. but you just have to be careful that it's not like the, the economically best decision is everyone runs this one map and then that's it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, I, I, that's, that, uh, that's, that's, that's tricky. That's why I'm such a big fan yeah. of like very, well, like more target farming and specific things so that there's like you have so many options of things mm -hmm. to track down. And I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you about how do you feel about loot tables and target farming? And in all my time playing Path of Exile now, uh, Path of Exile 1, I have only been able to discern one single item that drops anywhere, but also has like a higher chance from something. It's Rumi's concoction from Aziri or from Aziri's trial. That's the only thing I've been able to right. discern in 25,000 hours. Um, right. Is there going to be more things like that that are like similar to Diablo 2, right? Where Nightmare and Daryl is a higher drop chance of Stone of Jordan. Uh, are you approaching that in any way, like loot tables well, the, and target farming of, yeah, things that well, do the funny farm thing about globally? That, the funny thing about that is div cards kind of are mm -hmm. that in a way, because div cards ultimately are a way to target farm a certain thing. So I guess like, um, I mean, we haven't discussed whether or not exactly how div cards will come back and, and so on, but um, like if they, like, I mean, but effectively like div cards do serve the purpose of allowing you to target farm for a certain item with mm -hmm. higher chance at a certain area. Y yes, but there's there's a big difference there in that div cards usually drop in one zone. I'm talking about things that maybe right. drop globally, but something has a higher chance of dropping it. Right, right. Well, but so, the unique that the div card gives drops globally is, I think, what... Yeah, yeah, that's right. what I mean. So, like, if the unique the div card gives sure. drops globally, then the div card effectively serves as, like, a way to sure. target farm that thing mm -hmm. over, even though, you know... So, I guess I would say that those systems kind of seem a little bit similar to me. Um, right. As for whether or not the actual map boss itself would drop, um, like, more as opposed to the map, I, I guess we could consider doing that for something like a div card. Um, like, it's a potential way to kind of make it so that you've got that, like, that, that, that situation like that. Um, but I, I mean, my understanding was is that you had some issues with div cards uh, in, uh, in in Pee One as they are right now. So I'm curious <laughs> to talk about that if you want to talk more yeah, about it. Yeah, that's okay. So I'm just going to cut in because I also have issues with div cards in Pee One. Uh, first of all, on the idea of target farming in Pee Two and potentially tying something to the map boss, I think that's a cool idea. And having a way to target farm, especially the more common items, things like a lightning coil where you can get all the cards and assemble it, or Chevron's wrappings, which I guess isn't super common, but is farmable enough that it feels like it's something you can set out. All right, my goal is to farm a Shavs, and whether or not you want to get the currency, that's fine, but you can solo farm that. It's very achievable, whereas solo farming, say, a Mage Blood via Apothecaries, I mean, I'm sure people have done it, but good luck, it's not exactly a normal thing. My problem with divination cards isn't actually with div cards. It's with the types of things that div cards can have, which I expect is going to tie into Ziz's point here, so I'll let him finish now. So my next follow-up. So because right I, right. I was watching the, the Crypt talk about this, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I personally feel like divination cards, especially for boss drops and stuff, super devalue what they drop especially right, right. Mm -hmm. with something like the void or when they can come from diviners yeah not yeah. inherently against a divination card for a boss drop as a pity drop from either another really right. challenging boss or the boss itself right. um but yeah i wanted to know how do you want to approach divination card and strictness to keep boss right. drops exciting yeah this is exactly my problem with it it's okay to have a boss drop on a divination card there's a couple things in Pewee that i can immediately think of which do this well Cirrus has a chance to drop a card, which can be turned in for the Cortex. This way, you fight one boss to get another boss. That's totally fine. Cirrus is still a difficult and challenging pinnacle encounter, at least until you have a 200-something million Penance brand character. But let's be honest, at that point, you can't account for it. Sucre of the Sinless dropping off of Baron. It's not like Baron is super common. You, you can sort of chain him, but not really. Again, that's fine. Luminous Trove. Well, normally you would get voices from completing waves in the simulacrum. But you can instead fight the Crystal King in Delph, still a rare and difficult challenging encounter, and get the same reward, or at least a fraction of it. In all of these cases, I think the divination cards are used well. What I don't like is divination cards dropping from Void, that let's just say you get a Dying Sun from your Void. Day one, your level, I don't know, 72. You didn't fight the Shaper. No one has fought the Shaper yet. And you have a Dying Sun. That sucks. You open a stack deck and you get a card for Starforge, which is supposed to be this really cool iconic drop from Shaper that you now just got off of, I don't know, random skeleton number 4,057. 
I would really like to see boss drops either excluded entirely from div cards or restricted to only div cards that come from other challenging bosses that are roughly the same tier. So like Uber to Uber, Pinnacle to Pinnacle, that sort of thing. So we were actually just talking about this. So yeah, do you want to... Yeah, so I, I definitely agree with you in that it, it always makes me sad when a boss drop comes from a div card before a boss is even killed. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, we were talking about how it, it, it might just be better. Like, look, we, we don't actually know uh, how div cards are going to come into PoE2, but if they did, they, they would only be limited to world drop items and not boss specific items. Because, That's... I mean... In sure. theory, we could have the boss drop a div card for the boss's loot itself, but that sort of defeats the purpose yeah, a little bit. Exactly. So yeah, like basically, I, I think we were saying how if if we were doing it, we probably would prefer that we excluded things that um were in boss like boss specific loot. But I know there's even other things like so the other one that kind of also causes this is the um uh, the reliquary. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like that, and like Mark was saying that he feels a bit sad about the fact that you know like you've got foil things of a thing dropping before yep. you've actually got the ability for the players to get the the non foil one. Yeah, seems, seems a bit backwards. So there's like a bit of an issue there, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it's something something we definitely need to bear in mind. I, I would say. Yeah. And uh, we did sort of discuss a few things about ways to. Yeah, but I don't know if like I don't know if I've got a specific solution I'm quite happy with yet, but that is definitely a concern. Um, but at the same time, like I know that players really do enjoy the process of being able to create things like div cards, so it's something that I do want to try and have something like. I do like things like that being in the game, so um, you know, it's just a matter of making sure that we're controlling them right. Yeah. Well, uh, I have to say, I'm I'm so mixed right now because on the topic of div cards and boss loot. I think it's totally fine to completely exclude it or to make it only come from bosses. Uh, I think the pity idea is something that Torchlight Infinite actually does really well, where you can get powerful items like a pedigree of the gods from Traveler. You will either get a pedigree or you will get a card that is a fraction of a pedigree. So it still feels like you're making meaningful progress towards your goal because you want to get that pedigree drop that's rare and powerful and sells for thousands of flame elementium. When it comes to reliquary keys, and especially Valdos, same kind of thing, where in theory, it's cool. And I did quite a few of them. I think they're very cool content. They should be harder than bosses. So again, in theory, it's okay. But some of them actually aren't. Some of them are quite easy. And then what about an iconic item? Like, let's say, Progenesis. Is it okay to get a Progenesis without fighting the Maven? Obviously, discounting trade, but like doing content that gives it, I personally would say no. I would really rather that the progenesis comes from fighting the maven. And so maybe there's an approach similar to what's taken with some of the reliquary keys. Uh, there's the reliquary keys tied to a specific encounter that gives you a shiny from that. So instead of the Valdos puzzle box, now all of the forbidden flesh Valdos will drop from the Eater of Worlds. So you can put a drop rate on that that increases the overall value of that boss. The Forbidden Flame come from the Searing Exarch. The Progenesis come from the Maven. It's always going to be one of the boxes that has the boss drop, which would also make those specific Valdos even more valuable because you know, well, well hey, the only one in the pool is actually going to be pretty good. Or maybe it's uh, voided and you take increased damage over time and you only have one portal and you do less damage per item equipped and all of a sudden you're like, Good God, why does anyone do this? So there's definitely solutions within PoE systems already. It's something that's bothered me for a long time. It's why I hate stack decks. I feel like stack decks not only devalue target farming and devalue players' time as a result, but they also devalue these really cool boss drops because div cards of boss drops exist. Uh, I'd love to see a fix for this in PoE 1, but I'm very glad to know that GGG is aware of this and addressing it for PoE 2. This might have been answered. Uh, can we expect to pause when we're talking to a vendor or something like that? Like, say, for example, one of the merchants uh, in the current being affliction, oh, right? Yeah, like, like oh, being, like being attacked mechanic? while talking to them, yeah. Right. It's very frustrating. Um, You know, I haven't actually... I don't think we've actually talked about, talk, this. Talked about okay. that particularly. Something that we could do, I agree it's kind of lame when you're talking to... A, a, a world vendor and then monsters yeah. are kind of attacking you. Yeah, because it's so it's, frustrating it's right now. I'm in affliction yeah. and I'm like, I kill all the monsters. I look, I wait five seconds, and I talk to the vendor. Ten seconds later, there's a monster gnawing at me and I'm like, yeah, bro, yeah. bro. I know. I think that, oh, this has happened to me so many times with betrayal, which is even worse because then you can't see the screen at all. 
oh, that's happened so many times. So it's like, I, I feel like I've killed everything within a 50 mile radius. Sometimes there's literally only one monster left in the map because I'm like, I'm going to kill everything to prevent this. Nope. That one monster somehow just appears the second I talk to a vendor and it's going to hit really hard. It's the worst possible mod combo. I would very much like a fix for this. What well, my preferred solution to that, and there's no reason we couldn't do this in POE one, would be to like. I wonder if we can like. Now you got to be, okay. You just got to be really careful of exploitation. But I kind of feel like I'd rather do something like monsters don't aggro on you while you're talking to an NPC or something like that. Uh, just because I, 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 I like pausing. Like when you pause the world, it is like you do notice it, right? Like stuff stops. Like you know, like like if there's anything happening, like a, like if you talk to an NPC and like fireball stops moving across the screen, like it does seem a bit. It was very not, nice, not, I gotta not. say, in Ultimatum. <laughs> I really right. like that. I, I get um, I mean, yeah, but that's a little bit different, right? They've got like a different thing going on with that. But I, 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 as I said, I, I prefer thematically for most of, in most cases, to do some kind of like monsters don't aggro on you while they're talking to a vendor kind of solution, because I mm -hmm. think that would be more thematically good. But I do okay. understand that that's an issue, and we should really fix that, because, it, yeah, it's not very nice when that happens. Yeah. 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 Good. Awesome. Um... I would love to talk a little bit more about respecking and respect costs. I know mm -hmm. you've mm -hmm. talked previously about like making it free is not a good option. Um, yeah. But have you considered making the early game more accessible? I think that is probably as somebody that like all of my content specializes on new players. And I almost feel like I'm doing them a disservice if I tell them to play around and experiment. The reason for that is a lot of people then come back like, hey, I'm level 60. My build does no damage. How do I fix it? And to a level 60 player who's new to Path of Exile, the only solution is make a new character, which does make some people quit. Um, so something I was thinking about, like, for example, making regrets count for five times the amount at a low level or free respects until level 50 or 60, something like that. Do you have any thoughts? Well, I don't really enjoy the idea of a mechanic working differently early on and then, you know, it changing at some point. And really, this is this is going down to understanding what passives are going to do to you, right? Like that is a big part of it. But I mean, just also to, just experimentation, to, like, right? So, I feel like there's two things going on here. One that Harishi touched on: understanding what your passives are going to do. And in that regard, when I first downloaded Path of Exile, I spent about ten hours in Excel, doing the math behind the nodes, trying different things, and planning my character. My first character was not a brick. I followed that plan and it went really well. I don't think it's reasonable to expect people to do that. I did it because I come from an era where respects weren't a thing. That just wasn't common in games when I was growing up. And so I thought, all right, everything's permanent. When I went into PoE, I took that mentality. It ended up working out really well for me with my first character. But these days, I'm more likely to brick a save file, even in games where you can respect, just because I like trying stuff. I like experimentation. It's really fun to me. And so I'd love to be able to tell people, hey, yeah, you're starting PoE? Experiment. Try stuff. Your character will brick for a bit, but you can fix it. It's fine. Instead, I say, pick something and stick to it, because it's going to be very hard to change once you've gone down that path. Yeah, right. I, I guess I like. I, I, it's funny because this one does come up a lot, and a lot of people just propose, "Oh yeah, you should be able to just free respect when you're when you're low level," because it seems like an obvious answer to this so kind of problem. I, 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 guess... I don't think that's a good solution. I actually love that yeah, right, there's right. a yeah, cost yeah, yeah. and that, that your things have impact. Um, right, right. But it, it. Okay. Really, really important things is just said. Things have a cost and it has impact. Because the opposite is, it's too easy to respec and choices don't mean anything which leads to other bad behaviors. A good example of this is if you can free respec, let's say until level 60, why wouldn't a player use the most optimal leveling build to get to level 59, then fully respect their character into what they're gonna play, and then they hit 60 and all of a sudden gone. Before I played Torchlight Infinite, I actually probably would have said, oh yeah, free respecs, that makes sense. Having played Torchlight Infinite, it feels really bad to be level 81 where you can't respec anymore but you just changed your mind. And so having that permanence all the way along encourages you to make good choices. Having no permanence at all is bad. Having that weird space where you're like right before often leads to that pressure of, all right, do all your experimentation at the one level before, because after that you can't, 
So I kind of like a different fix to the problem entirely. It almost feels like permanently punishing the player when they're new and they don't understand. Well, I guess there's two things that I guess to break down that particular thing, it's like the main thing there is that they don't understand, right? And like the, mm -hmm. the, the don't understand part, I guess, is what I'd want to target is because like ideally the, I, the best goal is to make them understand the impact of their choices. So, I mean, we talked before about how we want to have it so that, you know, you can see when you um, go to allocate a skill, mm -hmm. what the exact effect on your character will be as far as like DPS on your skills and stuff like that. And I think that will mm -hmm. go a long way. Um, I just, yeah, like it, 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 I'm, I, I guess I still haven't hit on like a system that I think works really well as far as respecking goes. Like, like one one thing we talked about, for example, um, that I think is sort of interesting and the kind of thing I'd be willing to do um, would be that you can um, that you can free spec um, specialization points. Like those are the ones that let you um, specialize in a specific mm -hmm. thing. Like that would be the kind of role that you could have, which um, of like 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 is an understandable way to allow you to do um, uh, 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 things. Uh, through the whole game but you do start to run into issues where you'd have to make sure that you can only do it in town because um you know you don't want to be able to respec like mid in the fight. Of a boss fight you know like they throw like a fire attack at you and you just respec in a fire <laughs> into, 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 into fire resist and yeah. then you then you do a nice attack and then you're like oh so i'll respec back that kind of thing would be would be not good yeah um but i i'd be okay with this uh partial respec where there's almost flex points it does mean you're probably gonna have to respec them a lot more actively uh, again, I wonder if there's some sort of gradual cost scaling that could be introduced. It, it can't be that regrets just work differently. And I think that makes sense because it's definitely going to be a major confusion point to players of, oh, respect gives me five points. And then, wait, it gives me three. I could have sworn it was five. Wait, what? One? Am I going crazy here? So I get why that's a bad idea. Uh, fully free respect or free respect to a level bracket also seems kind of bad. I wonder if the fix is just give people more respect points in the campaign. Like what if you got 60 respect points in the campaign? Well, that cost would ramp up because you're still spending them to respec. And the more points you have, the more it's going to cost. But once you go and do it, all the systems fall into place in endgame. So yeah, I don't know. 50, 100, some other number. And yeah, that might push the meta of level optimally, do a full respec kind of thing. At that point, you can probably just afford twink leveling gear anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, that's the kind of thing that I'd be more okay with. Um, but like, so there has to be like a, ideally there'd be some kind of consistent rule that allows you to feel like you're not losing the um, the the character of your character, for whatever that means. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while also kind of, you know, is it, I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky one. Like, I mean, we do get asked this all the time, right? Like, it's mm. one of those things that, like, it's just a constant issue on people's minds. Um, a minor thing too is, uh, I think we've made at least, like, I guess this isn't completely done, but the passatory is meant to have more generic nodes at the start, and then they start becoming more specialized as you, right, as you, you know, travel further out. I mean, that's sort of true in Peer. We want it is. It is sort of true. It is true. Know, but it we're trying to make sure that that is the case, right? right? And that Where... can kind of mean that you don't really have. That, so, that sort of issue as much. Yeah. So you've said that there, it's going to be more indicative on the skill tree how much something is going to do for your build, right? Mm -hmm. Will you be able to sort of, let's say that I, instead of left clicking a node, I right click a node and it anticipates that you have that. Will you then be able to see it without having enough points to go there? Because a big problem I, mean, I see is, let's say that somebody starts as a marauder, right? And they end up traveling all the way up to witch instead of down mm -hmm. to duelist, right? Because yeah. they, they didn't know like what kind of nodes to expect there and stuff. If they aren't mm -hmm. able to like sort of plan it out a little bit, let's say they have like 10, 20 shadow nodes that they can assign to sort of pre-plan right. their route in-game a little bit. That would do it. So you, want to, be able to, you want to be able to see the final result on your character of... Uh, of um... All the nodes up to all the, the nodes up to like like well of, of basically pre if I take these ten nodes like, yeah. it is yeah even though I don't yeah. have any skill points ready to put right we actually discussed this a little bit and I guess I'm a bit undecided as to whether that's good or bad so I previously said before that I want to avoid too much like path of building stuff in the game client because mm. I feel like it can. Mm -hmm. Developing. But on the other hand, like it does seem harmless what you're talking about, and it wouldn't actually be hard to implement once we've got the point, once we've got the ability to, okay, assuming that we already have the ability to show you what the change on your character is for a single node, right? There's no reason it would be harder to do multiple nodes. Like it's sort of, it's, it's, it's easy right. enough. 
Yeah. Um, so like, I mean, it's the kind of thing I could see us potentially doing, but I guess I'd have to explore like what the full sort of implications of that are. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the kind of thing we could potentially do. Cool. Cause that would definitely give a good middle of a road approach where you're not giving people the respects, but they're not spending the points to begin with. It's just forecasting. And then the responsibility falls on the player. You can plan your next 20 nodes or your next 10 nodes or your next five nodes, whatever it is. I think five's a good number. No, five's a little low. Let's say 10. Uh, that's what Ziz mentioned. And I do think it's a pretty solid amount. So you plan your next 10 nodes. If you like what you see, cool. You can actually spec into them and progress. If you don't like what you see, you go, mm, maybe I go a different way. Maybe going up to which isn't actually the way to build a Marauder. Maybe I do go down to Duelist. And that gives the players who care and will, you know, put in the time flexibility. And if someone doesn't want to put in effort to learn the game, etc., I think, I mean, in 2024, they're going to look at a guide anyway, so it probably doesn't matter that much. No, just as a random anecdote along those lines. Oh, no, I love this. We That's... used to we used to have a uh, a, a, a rule internally, um, which was don't balance by rarity. So the theory was that oh, it's a bad idea to um, have something which is ultra powerful, but is only the only reason why it's okay is because it's because it's rare. Okay. And um, we worked we 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 worked under that assumption for many many years, and then eventually we realized like like I, I actually can't really justify that rule anymore because um like you know actually people really love stuff that's balanced by rarity. Like mm -hmm. people like it to have it, so there's just an ultra rare thing that's ultra powerful. And so yeah, we stopped having that rule uh, a while back, and uh, so now we do allow ourselves to just have like this is a p item that is too powerful to exist except for the fact that it's that ultra very, rare yeah. and therefore it's okay. Um, cool. So that kind of stuff we do do we do do nowadays. Very cool. I'm pretty sure that happened in Ultimatum League 314 because I remember seeing Hateforge and going, oh my God, that's so powerful. There's no way that stays in the game. And then what happened? It stayed in the game. And then we got Mageblood. Then we got Squire. We got Ashes of the Stars. Then we got Progenesis and all these items. But I was like, there's no way this is going to get nerfed. I think when I made a video about Progenesis, I was like, this flask will be nerfed next league because I was so used to GGG going, no, no, that's too powerful. That's too powerful. We have to tone it down. And now it just seems to me full balls to the wall. You know what? You get something that's rare enough, you get to break the game. Uh, there's, of course, a danger of this if there's too many things uh, or if they're too rare. D4 on launch had this. They had uber uniques. Um, none of them really broke the game, but... Also, you didn't find them, so it wouldn't matter if they did. Could have been the coolest thing in the world. Nobody had them. So definitely a lot of things to approach in that regard. Pee has done a really good job of making powerful items, at least from my perspective, feel relatively obtainable and also insanely fun and powerful. And that will continue to be the yeah, case yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, in Pee too, uh, can we expect to see more things itemized like the ash lane slam and and things that people are currently trying to buy as services from other people well this is really a i i guess it's really tied to poe one because i don't know if that's mechanic in particular well, no, it, it, it does matter in poe two basically yes we understand we, the yeah, fact yeah, like, yeah, in yeah. general we are trying very hard to avoid any situation where an item where, where a thing that someone would want to trade is not itemized yeah good and, and to specifically address Isling slam that I believe there's some changes coming with that in the next patch as well. Um, so. I think there are a bunch of uh, things getting itemized in uh, in the next yeah. uh, POE 1 update. That's huge. Like, Ashling Slams are one of the few things that it's super annoying to buy because you have to, A, go and look for someone who has the slam, B, go into their map, deal with their ping, C, give them the item, they slam it, it's a trust trade. They have to give it back to you. And sometimes I've had to do this two times, five times, eight times. I'm going to be honest. Uh, this is awesome news and I can't wait. Things like temples, once they got itemized, so much easier to interact with. Does that mean certain types of crafts will become potentially more expensive? Yeah. Uh, we saw that with temples, actually, where they have at some points become more expensive because of that. Ultimately, that probably just means if you want to farm those, it'll be even more profitable. So kind of an upside more than a downside. I'm super excited to see the full list of things that are getting itemized. Very, very happy to see that. Very cool. Um, so, uh, 
yeah, yeah. So I mean, that, that that's the thing we're very we're very much aware of. I had a thing, like an idea, if you will, that I, I wanted to okay. get your thoughts on. So obviously, um, I think this is very popular, and and I've done this quite a lot when I play hardcore trailer because I'll offer a boss kill service. Have you ever mm -hmm. thought about offering a feature like that in the game where you have, let's say, a bounty board? Um, you can request, hey, I want Cyrus to be killed. Here's my Cyrus set. And then in order to not be scammed, me as the completer of this bounty board has to offer my own set. So if I rip it, I lose my own set, not the buyers. Right. And then the item goes to the person, et cetera, like something like that. Right, right. So this is effectively trying to avoid the need for third party ways to trade for this kind of stuff that currently exists. Correct. Um, I guess I would, my concern with that is I worry a little bit about adding that as a, an in-game um, element because um, the message would be that, like, I mean, I think you'd get a lot of characters who just like didn't complete the game without ever actually really beating everything. Yeah. Um, so I'd be a bit hesitant to add something like that as a, um, a, as a feature um, to the, uh, like, I said, I'd just be a little bit hesitant about adding yeah. something like that. Um, I mean, we're implicitly saying that you need to be killing all those bosses. Right, and right. Having it mm -hmm. as a feature we, is sort of saying you can trade for it. I mean, we're not yeah. preventing you from right. doing so. People, but... people will obviously do that. But I guess the thing then is that um, if you, there's no secure way to do it, it obviously incentivizes all the stuff around reputation systems and blah, 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 blah. There's like a whole rant about that that's like complicated. Yeah. Um, so I understand why you desire that because like, okay, the, ultimately what you're looking for there is like, what are all the things that people use TFT to do? Right, like that's what that's what you're looking for, and let's try and let's try and let's try and have a solution to every single one of those. And that we we think along the same lines as well, right? Like we when we're looking at the stuff, we're kind of like you know, well, let, let, like good to like, hear. Let, let's try to prevent any reason that you would need to have a service like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, uh, that we certainly we're thinking about it that way as well. Um, but then a service like this, I kind of start to feel a little bit uneasy about because um, it would be very easy then to be like you know, I'm, I'm, I'm effectively telling people we want you to be just playing the game without really playing it, which yeah. is, a, is a slight concern. But I mean, at the same time, we do have to be realistic that people are going to trade for that stuff anyway. So we do have to think about it. But yeah, I, 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 I get it and understand. Cool. And obviously there's a whole big conversation around trade to, and stuff that, yeah. you know, is, is, is a whole thing to talk about, which, I mean, I guess we could talk about that if you like. Yeah. Uh, Before we get into the whole trade thing, I just want to talk a little bit about boss carry stuff. And in fact, I'm going to do this in an interesting way where, uh, let's see. All right. So here's my YouTube channel. I'm curious, Paul, have you ever purchased a boss carry? Don't mind my typing. So have you ever purchased a boss carry in PoE? Do you do it every league? Once or twice? No, never. Because ultimately what this comes down to is the frequency. That if, let's just say 0.3% of a total PoE player base either buys or sells a boss carry, there's probably no real need to support it in game. But if 30% of a player base engages with that, then there's a really strong need to have that system. If a lot of people are going to do it anyway, a lot of people are already uh, skipping the gameplay aspect, GGG should absolutely be supporting this because then they're preventing scams and other issues. Again, though, if most people aren't, then there's not really a need. And by the way, I will try to remember to leave a pinned comment with the results of a poll because there's probably going to be a couple day lag time between when the video comes out and when I'm editing it. A fun fact, if you saw the poll pop up immediately, congrats, you know when I'm recording this. Um, I, I mean, so... are you fundamentally approaching trade from a any different way? I believe, I, I feel like I remember you said you weren't, but I, I would love to hear you talk yeah, about so it. Yeah, previously, so previously we had said that um, we're not really wanting to change how trade is. Um, but I think, uh, okay, so then... The situation now is different because, um, you know, like people are seeing things like Last Epoch and so on and what they're doing with trade and the people are like really liking what they're doing. And so then I don't know that we live in a world anymore where the current system that we have is good enough. Um, and so that means that we have to um, we have to change. Wow. I I was not expecting that. I'll be honest. Trade has always been a very hard line for GGG and 
I've always said that, you know what, if a dev draws a hard line on something, that is their right. It's your choice as a consumer to either play the game or not. But at that point, you shouldn't fight them on it because it's their creative vision. Uh, I'm very, very surprised to see this very big change for PE2 inspired by Last Epoch, which is a system that's extremely ambitious. It's a new way to reimagine trade. And I would say, regardless of how trade feels in Last Epoch, it has been successful in that it has caused the market leader in ARPGs to change how they're approaching trade for their next game. That is huge. And uh, I don't want to necessarily go into every detail about that, but I guess what I will say is that like the, pre the previous feeling that we had was um okay well, so he, he, let, let's talk about the axioms of like where mm -hmm. of, of like what we what we assume right so a we are a game that does not have um uh uh bind on bind on bind on anything right mm -hmm. we are not a game that has binding in it which i like right that, that that's a very important thing for us okay. so any system that involved binding we we don't want we don't want to do that oh um number two if you have a uh trade system that's ultra easy that has no uh friction at all like if you imagine just like instant buyout with like just like like with, with no restriction like everything is just completely um uh, uh free to trade what yeah. you get is a um an exponential curve where effectively the stuff that is the most uh powerful will become very 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 expensive and the stuff that's anything even below that will become extremely extremely cheap um so uh you get this kind of exponential curve and effectively if you imagine a game with no trade you've got like a flat effect of like power and so this is something that's really important which i think often gets missed in the discussion about trades and games because people often look at yeah but i want to buy this thing right now they don't look at how many other people also want to buy that thing where you very quickly get locked out of markets in frictionless trade i've seen it happen in world of warcraft where prices have absolutely exploded uh, I saw it happen for a bit in RuneScape. Uh, it happened a ton in Torchlight Infinite. That, the first three seasons of Torchlight Infinite were essentially a lesson in why having friction in your trade is important because it caused certain prices to just absolutely spiral out of control in these awful ways. And you'd get behind and you'd stay behind because the items that you're easily and accessibly farming go down. But the stuff that you want to buy keeps going up because the people at the top are just farming better stuff. And so I'm really, really glad that Jonathan is aware of this and is thinking about it when designing the system for PoE2. And, and difficulty acquire, sorry, uh, sorry, price and difficulty acquire are, are, are completely flat. Yeah. Not that, and again, with no trade, that would even make sense. But effectively, it turns into a flat line. And then you get more and more exponential as you, um, uh, as, as you increase the easiness of trade. So therefore, the assumption is that there has to be some way of, in order for a game to be able to have trade, there needs to be something that restricts its use in some manner. And mm -hmm. the previous way we looked at that was that you can either have instant buyouts or you can have instance like 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 good search, which we and, have good search, um, but no instant buyouts. What we've uh, been saying is okay, well. I don't think players are going to accept anything less than instant buyouts because I don't think there is a way to solve like to, to solve the kinds of problems that people have with trade and POE without having instant buyouts. So therefore, we now have to take as an axiom there must be instant buyouts, right? We must have that. There must be in some manner a way. How can we have that without uh, uh, having this problem? Now, previously we would have said, okay, well, in that case, you can't have good search, but... I have, in Torchlight Infinite, in instant buyouts were always a thing. In Season 1, the search was bad. I can tell you right now, it is not fun to play a game that has instant buyouts and poor search. It is super, super frustrating. Uh, over time, XD has done a good job of improving their search functionality and they're still working on it. But I can tell you right now, I will take no instant buyouts and great search over instant buyouts and terrible search any day of the week. But I'm really curious what Jonathan says next. People will not accept a solution that doesn't involve the ability to search for items correctly. Therefore, we must have, as well, we must have a proper search function. Okay. So what are we to do now then, right? Like if we, if we, if we must have instant buyouts and search, uh -huh. there has to be some manner of uh, way to limit trade in some other means. Yeah. Now, um, if we're not going to have binding, mm -hmm. that means there has to be some form of resource. Like a tax. That limits trade in some manner that you have to play the game to get 
or favor an Ellie. And if that's the case, well, what resources do we have? Well, in Peewee 2, we have gold. Oh. And uh, if gold is something... So therefore, we discussed basically gold can be a limiting factor. And uh, if we make it so that you can't trade gold, you can only play for gold. Mm -hmm. And if we add a gold fee as a part of an instant buyout uh, cost... Uh, okay. That can mean that we can potentially have a trade system that has instant buyouts and searching while still having a way to, um, and and no binding and all that sort of stuff. So it is basically, it is possible to do that. That's um, really cool. So we're discussing it, right? We're looking into this. Um, we, uh, I think that uh, it solves a really important problem. I believe it is possible. We have to, as I said, we're, like we know there's a lot of details to work out. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of issues yeah. and concerns. But as I said, I think that it is wow. people will no longer accept an action RPG that doesn't have instant buyouts um, as a wow. for a trade system. So therefore, um, we uh, will need to change. And um, as I said, the, you know, yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's, we, have, we have to move with the times, right? Like we can't. And, 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 and as I said before, you know, I don't want to have any excuses if players are not enjoying something. We need to find a way to solve that problem. So, um, yeah, well, we, will, we will solve that problem. Uh, we will find a way. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's my thinking on it anyway. Jonathan is just super based. Like, oh my God, that is such a cool solution too. And you can tell he spent a lot of time thinking about the problem, thinking about, okay, philosophically, why don't we like things being a certain way? And if you look at it from the big picture here, sure, it's annoying that right now you can't just go in PoE and click something and buy it. But GGG isn't just doing that because they hate you. They're doing that in part to protect you because someone else could also go click that thing. And if someone else has more money, the price goes up, et cetera, et cetera, that there needs to be friction to counter the exponential inflation and deflation, that divergence between the items you farm and the items everyone else farms. And so this is a really cool solution because gold is going to be that mediator instead of friction or gold is the friction, which means if you just want to casually engage with a system, you can have plenty of gold to do that, but if you just want to sit there trading all day, you're going to have to do a lot of it manually instead of using the instant buyouts because, well, it'll exceed the amount of gold you can farm. That's a really smart solution. Um, yeah, but also, so hopefully that, if you've yeah. got any questions about that, feel free to... <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I can feel myself uh, being posted to Reddit right now. Uh, yeah. I think, okay. I think <laughs> most people will be very happy about that. Um right. Yeah, no, I mean, I've always been asked about my take on an auction house in PoE, and I've always said, mm -hmm. like, in PoE 1, like, you have no way to tax it, right? What are you going to do? Like, do 0.5 right. of a Chaos Orb. So, yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I... That TLI tried that. I don't think it's very good. I think it was a fine band-aid. Uh, they should really move on to a better system. I did in previous games. I would sit there flipping items, which is very destructive. Right, right. But, with, yeah, with too. something like yeah. a tax, then you can have that. So, uh, yeah. yeah. That'd be really interesting. I, I'm guessing you were also thinking about maybe just a, a trading orb, right? That you would be, uh, if you weren't. Um, you could gold. do that, but I don't like the feel of it as much. And I think mm -hmm. um, associating gold, like the like the end game sync for gold being trade, is actually good because it makes sense yeah. that that's what gold would be used for. Um, and like it all kind of it all kind of fits together. Um, and um, so I think that that would be. I think that can work well. Um, so, Are you? Uh, yeah. Are you worried? Like, are we going to have captures on the auction house? Like, how are you going to combat bots, basically? Well, they do have to play the game for mm -hmm. gold, I suppose. But yeah, so that would be that the main too. thing. Is that yeah, but, 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 yeah. yes, because 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 the gold is um yeah. would not so you be can't tradable. Just snipe it. Uh, it would mean that yeah, you effectively have to play the game. Sure, you can bot playing the game, but on some level, if you're doing that already, then you know, like you sure. I mean, we need to we need to prevent yep. bots yeah. in, in whatever way we prevent bots that we do. Yeah. So yeah, that that, that that's what it is. Um, awesome. But. Uh, yeah um yeah yeah well, well another follow-up <laughs> question it would would everything go on the auction house like currency items uniques everything or would, it be, there, would there be something that you still have to do Good person point. to person trading um i think that people would want to be able to trade anything in such a system yes. um 100%. i can't uh, yeah i mean that, no that, binding that's basically the, the thing. let me now, trade everything. To, to look at this though one thing i would just want to pre uh, talk about there is that like stuff that is that has its own sync so currency items you don't necessarily need to have the the gold cost of transferring that be very high because um, uh, it's because it already has a sync. Um, it, you don't get that exponentiation factor quite so much. Mm -hmm. uh, but stuff like equipment, where there is no natural sync for it except for like you know crafting failure, I guess. Um, you do actually have to make the cost for trading uh, equipment to be quite high in order to preserve the um, 
uh, the, 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 like so you don't get that exponential being too high. Um, so effectively, you you we, you would have to prepare yourself for the fact that the gold cost for for buying equipment in particular could be could be could be relatively sizable. Um, that makes a lot of sense, and that also does discourage flipping because I'm going to guess the gold cost scales with the item itself, i.e., insta buying a headhunter is going to be very very expensive. Whereas Insta buying a hundred Chaos Orbs might be cheap because, again, Chaos Orbs are something you generally want players to exchange and trade with each other for value. Uh, a lot of people have always said, hey, I want an auction house just for currency. If that's all you wanted it for, you can use your gold to instant buy, you know, oh, I need some Chaos. Oh, I need some Divines. Whatever it is. Swap your currencies around. Oh, I need 50 Essences. I'm just going to, you know, Insta buy them right now. That's where all your gold goes. It'll be relatively cheap, so you'll have no problems with that. You can do it whenever you want. Then when it comes to the gear, the things that you're not trading too frequently, you still do that manually. Because let's be honest, if you only buy one headhunter every league, it's not really the worst thing to manually trade a person to buy your one headhunter every league. So uh, that, that that that's part of the whole, like the trade the trade you're making here with us of being able to have this feature yeah. is that the gold cost rate would be, um, would be quite high. Uh, that's for equipment only. Do you think you'd be taxing both the buyer and the seller? Uh, I believe that the buyer is the right um, place oh. for it because sellers want to be able to just, uh, in order to incentivize people to use the system over the old one, um, you'd effectively want to make sure that the sellers can still just dump all of their stuff um, into the, you know, in, into tabs like they normally do. And it's the buyers. Because I mean, ultimately, when you look at the, the who's the person bearing the the, 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 the the burden of this right now, it's not really the seller that's that's the person doing that. It's the buyer because the buyer is the one who has to fight through all of the fake yeah. listings and all of the like annoying people that reply and all of that garbage. So effectively, they're the ones who would pay for the uh, the tax on this, as it were. Yeah. Okay. That's really cool. Uh, Path of Exile 2 may have the best trading system of any ARPG hands down. And I really, really like the idea of you tax the buyer, but not the seller. Most games will tax the seller. And I can tell you right now, just psychologically, it feels bad to be like, oh, I sold this item for this cool amount of money. Oh, I, I got less. Like, does it really matter? No. But psychologically, it feels bad. Whereas if you're a buyer, you're like, okay, well, I can either pay the tax, get my item right now. I'm happy to do that. I mean, hell, there have been times where I've messaged people in Path of Exile for a 1C item, and I'm like, I know you're probably not going to answer because it's a 1C item, but if you do, I will give you a Divine Orb. I will pay 200 times the value of your item because I just want to trade. Because I needed it. I wanted to get to leveling. I didn't care about the cost. And in that case, I'm perfectly happy to pivot tax as a buyer. I actually think Last Epoch could learn a lot from this approach because gold in Peary 2 Looks like it's not that different from a trading perspective than favor. What would that look like if we reimagine Last Epoch's Merchants Guild with this in mind? Yes, yes, I know. Pure reaction video, but I'm going to talk about Last Epoch. It's coming out soon. It's a cool game. I want it to succeed. So here's my idea for that. You no longer have to spend any favor to list items. You can list as much as you want. Because again, that gets things moving in the economy. And you can price it for whatever you want. The favor cost does not scale with your price. It scales with the item itself. So very rare and powerful equipment items will cost more favor. You have to get favor by playing the game. And only the buyer pays favor. That way, you are incentivized to sell as much as possible, stimulating the economy, putting things into it. Uh, one of my big concerns with Last Epoch's Merchant's Guild in its current form is... People won't be high enough level or incentivized enough to actually put things into the economy so it will never develop and Circle of Fortune will just be better. This fixes that problem entirely because then you would pay favor when you're buying it. It's, oh, all right, I want my next upgrade. I've saved up some favor. I've done some grinding. I didn't get it as a drop. I'm going to go buy it now. That is really, really cool. So those are some of my thoughts about the interview that Zizarin did with Jonathan and Harishi. Again, if you want to see the entire video, watch for full context, all the stuff, do be sure to check it out over on Zizarin's channel. I highly recommend you do so, as there are a lot of other good questions, but this video is getting long enough, so I didn't have time to cover them. Now, I did save the best for last, uh, also just because I went chronologically through the video. Uh, I actually cut this down a lot from what it originally was, 
I'm just blown away by the trade. Oh my God. I I think that's going to be the best trade system we've seen, maybe not just in any ARPG, but in any game, period. That just sounds super cool. Peewee's always had one of the best economies of any game I've played. And uh, the only one that came close is RuneScape back in the day. The trade system was a little clunky. It was frictious, but I was willing to put up with it because I understood why. It's the medicine to get better or to fix the economy in this analogy. And it looks like they're doing a lot to address the problems players have had with that while also keeping the core effect through gold. It's really cool. I'm super excited for it. I hope it works out. I also really liked Zizarin's interview style here, talking just about the stuff that he personally found interesting. There are so many questions that, like, if you sat me down in front of Jonathan and said, hey, you can ask anything, I would have asked as well, like div cards, 100% right there with you. So glad you asked that. So yeah, great interview, had a ton of fun. Uh, that said, if you want to see me do more React videos, let me know down in the comments. I know I haven't done them a ton. I've always kind of experimented with a style because it's always a, a little uncomfortable. I did reach out to Zizarin. He was totally chill with me reacting to it. And so, yeah, if you want to see me react to more stuff, let me know down below. Also, let me know if you have any thoughts on anything that I talked about here. Now, if you're looking for something else to watch, I did also react to an interview that Riker did at Gamescom with Jonathan and Chris. It was another really good one, so I strongly recommend it. The link will be up in the card and down below. With that said, special thanks to my patrons and channel members for the continued support. For as low as $1 a month, you cannot make videos just like this one possible. And also, thank you to everyone who made it to the end. I know this has very much been a long one, and on the one hand, sorry that I rambled on, but also not sorry because I had fun doing it and hopefully you had fun watching it. But I've probably taken up enough of your time today, so I'll see you again sometime soon.